Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Morris of Biological Sciences at Bowling Green State University, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the third Kids Tech program at BGSU. And this program is put together in conjunction with support from the university, a research grant from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the logistical support of the 4-H program of Wood County and Ottawa County and a lot of volunteers, some of whom you've already met. They're sitting beside you. Thank you. Okay. All right. This morning, we're very pleased to invite Dr. David Francis from Ohio State University. He's on the research campus, uh, the OARDC in Worcester, Ohio. David and I have known each other for about 20 years. Uh, we first met in the same tomato research lab, then I went off in a different direction, and David stayed with tomatoes. Uh, this morning, David is going to tell you a little bit about tomatoes and some very interesting aspects of what they're good. Yes, you have a question. Okay, you think you know about tomatoes. Well, I'm sure there will be more things that you'll want to ask David at the end of his talk. Keep those in mind. We would like lots of good questions. Okay, David? Before I start to talk about how we can look at the DNA and tell whether a tomato is red or not, I want to ask you a couple of questions. So, raise of hands. How many of you have ever been on a farm? That's more than I expected. How many of you have a garden? Pretty good, pretty good. How many of you like tomatoes? All right, how about ketchup? How many of you like ketchup? Hmm. All right, just, just one more question, and it's not on the slide. How many of you know that ketchup is made from tomatoes? All right. It's a, it's a Wood County, Ottawa County audience. That's great. Okay. We're going to talk about tomato fruit and why tomato fruit are red. All right. So the first thing I want you to know, make sure everybody knows, is that tomato fruit come from tomato flowers. Did you know that? Okay, not everybody knows that. So when the, when the tomato flower gets pollinated, the fruit forms from that fertilized ovary. Okay, so this little piece right up there turns into that over there, all right? So tomatoes aren't always red. You knew that too, right? You knew that you could have yellow, orange, even purple tomatoes, right? The color of tomato is determined by their genes, and we're not talking about blue genes, we're talking about genes in the DNA. So genes are made of DNA, and that's what we're talking about today. All right, so the short answer to that question, why are tomatoes red, is because of their genes. But that's not really a satisfactory answer, is it? It doesn't tell you that much. What we're going to talk about today is DNA and genes, we're going to talk about these things called proteins. We're going to talk about biochemical pathways, vitamins, how changes in DNA can affect proteins, biochemical pathways, and vitamins. We're going to talk about eating your vegetables. And the last one is there because we know that your parents are in the next room. We're going to talk about listening to your parents when they tell you to eat your vegetables. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. I was really joking, I was really joking about the last two. All right? Okay, so I wanted to start with some of the basics about DNA. So how many of you have ever heard that DNA makes RNA and RNA makes proteins? Have you, some of you have heard about that? You could even make a song out of it if you wanted to, right? Try singing it, right? Okay, DNA makes RNA, RNA makes proteins. The reason that that's important is because genes are made of DNA. One gene usually codes for one protein, and proteins do things, all right? That's what 
that's an important connection to make. Okay. So this, this concept that DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein is what people call the central dogma of molecular biology. It's one of those rules that is almost always right, but every once in a while it's not. Okay? So when you get to the point where you're doing the kind of work that, that Dr. Morris does, you're going to start to be talking about some variations on this rule. But almost always this rule is correct, and this rule is relevant to our topic of why tomatoes are red or not. Okay? This is what DNA looks like. Okay? So DNA is a molecule that's described as a double helix. Double means it has two sides, and helix means it twists. Okay? The important thing that I want you to understand about DNA is that it's made up of four bases, and we would call those adenine, thymine, guanine, and cysteine. Okay? Those four bases we can just shorten and call them A, T, G, and C. That's easy, right? Okay? The other thing that's important is that one side of the molecule tells you what's on the other side of the molecule. All right? So, DNA is composed of A, G, C, and T. You guys have to remember that. All right? It's A, G, C, T. You want to chant it? Okay. A, G, C, T. What about T, A, C, G? That works. All right? Okay, remember those letters. So the other thing that you need to, to know about DNA is it has this part of the molecule which we call a backbone. Okay, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that backbone, but it's got a sugar and it's got phosphorus. And that sugar has this group that we call OH hanging off in a posi particular position that we call the three prime end. And the phosphate is on the other end, which we call the five prime end. And, and we use that just to give the molecule direction so that, you know, if, well, when Paul was giving me directions here, he said turn left and then turn right, right? So if we're talking about the DNA molecule, we'd say go from the five prime to the three prime or the three prime from the five prime, okay? So the other thing that's really important to remember about DNA is that A always pairs with T and G always pairs with C, okay? So What's important about that is it means if you know the order of the A's, G's, C's, and T's on one side of the molecule, you can tell what's on the other side, right? So if it's A on one side, it has to be T on the other, right? So if it's G on one side, what does it have to be on the other? You guys are good. All right. Okay. Yeah, and then the other thing to remember is the last point is that the way the molecule is organized, on one side it's 5 prime to 3 prime, and on the other side it's the reverse of that. So we call that anti-parallel. All right? So, why should we care about DNA? I guess I should ask whether any of you care about it now. Does anybody care about DNA? Not so many, maybe. Okay. So. One of the things that I want you to understand after today is that a change in the DNA can change the protein, okay? Changes in this process called transcription can change how much protein, and that both of these kinds of differences can create a change, right? A change like why tomatoes are red, okay? So DNA can replicate itself because one strand contains all the information it needs to make the other strand. DNA makes RNA, and that's a process that we call transcription. It's a big word, but all you have to know is that DNA can make RNA. And then it's the RNA that makes the protein, and we call that translation. Okay? We're going to focus mostly on transcription and translation today. All right? So, Another piece of information I want to give you is that this process of transcription, that is the DNA making RNA, is controlled by a switch. Okay, and we call that switch the promoter. Now the reason that I put up all these different pictures of different kinds of switches is because promoters are like that. There's some promoters that are really simple. Turn it on, turn it off. There's other ones that are pretty complex. You can turn it on and then dial it up a little bit, or you can dial it down, right? This promoter is, is the, 
It's the piece of DNA that says, turn the gene on in a leaf, or in a root, or in a flower, or in a fruit. Okay? So that promoter regulates how much RNA is made from the gene. All right? So switches are going to be important in our talk. All right? Now, this process of translation, this is where things get kind of exciting. Okay, so this is the process where we go from RNA to a protein, right? Proteins are made from some basic building blocks. They're made from something called an amino acid. And we're not going to talk about amino acid structures or anything, but what you have to understand is that there are 20 amino acids, okay? And the combination of those 20 amino acids is what makes a protein, okay? So how do we get from DNA that has only four bases, remember, A, T, C, and G, to 20 different amino acids, right? Well, it turns out it's a code, right? The DNA is a code. It contains the information for those building blocks, right? So if we look at the DNA molecule here, we've got the, the A's, T's, G's, and C's all down there. A group of three of those bases is what we call a codon, OK? So if, you ha if, if information was coded in only two bases, how many different proteins could you make? Yeah. Did you want to answer? Yeah. OK. Are you going to tell me? <laughs> hmm. Not quite. So you could go A and T, A and C, A and G, right? And then you could go T and G, T and C, right? So go. Yep. Could only make eight. OK? So two isn't enough. Three turns out to be too many, but this is, how, this is how our bodies do it. Most organisms use a code that we would call redundant. So it uses three bases. And the way you'll see these in textbooks, the way this works is that the first base is here, the second is across the top, and then the third is down here. And so using this three base code, you can get 20 amino acids. You can also get three that say, stop making a protein right now, right? And then some of them are redundant. So there's this, this amino acid called glycine over here, alanine and valine there. You can get those three different ways. OK? So again, the codons are telling the cell to, make, to put in a specific amino acid in making that protein. So what happens if you change a base? in the DNA. Remember, it's code. So if I'm spelling cat and I turn, change the first letter from C to B, what have I spelled? It's a different word, right? So what happens if I change a base? You answer. It turns, OK, the base, so the DNA is different, and so the amino acid could be different, which means the protein is going to be different, right? So. That's how the code works. All right. So now we're going to go a next step, right? RNA makes proteins, but how do proteins do things, right? Well, one of the ways that proteins do things is that they're organized in your body into something that we would call a biochemical pathway. And what I'm showing on this slide is a map of a couple of different biochemical pathways. It's pretty complicated, right? Um, there's lots of lines all over the place. The little dots represent a step that a protein is doing. We would call that protein an enzyme, but let's just think of it as a protein. I, I want to simplify it a little bit. This is a biochemical pathway that shows how proteins can change one pigment into another in the tomato fruit. Okay, So this, this compound at the top, which is called phytoene, it's yellow. OK, so when you see a tomato flower, it's yellow, it has phytoene in it, right? There's a couple of proteins that will convert that phytoene into something that we call cis-lycopene. It's a big word, 
What you need to know about cis-lycopene is it's, it's really orange. It's so orange that we call it tangerine, right? There's an enzyme that then converts that cis-lycopene into another kind of lycopene. It just straightens out the molecule. That's red. It's really red. And then there's another protein that takes lycopene and it converts it into beta carotene. All right, so the first answer to our question of why are tomatoes red is because they have lycopene and beta carotene in them. Okay, these are, these are molecules that are what we would call pigments. They give the fruit color. Okay, there's also a reason why you should care about these pigments. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of beta carotene later, but I'll just give it away right now. Beta carotene goes by another name, and that other name is provitamin A. Your body can't make its own vitamin A, but it can take beta carotene and it can turn it into vitamin A. Okay? If you don't have enough vitamin A in your body, you go blind. All right? and your body doesn't make any of it. So you have to get it from your diet, and the only way you can get it from your diet is if you eat some fruits and vegetables. So based on the name and the color of beta carotene, who can tell me a, a vegetable that has a lot of it? Shout it out, go ahead. Carrots. Right, so carrot, carrot is probably the vegetable that has the most beta carotene, but for most of us, most Americans, we get more beta carotene from ketchup than we do from carrots, right? The only reason is because we don't eat enough carrots, right? Okay, who likes carrots? Let's see. I think there's almost more people that say they like carrots than tomatoes. Let's see who likes tomatoes. Okay, who likes both tomatoes and carrots? Both hands. Hmm, not as many. We're going to have to work on that. I, I think maybe we are going to have to talk a little bit more about eating your vegetables today. Okay, 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 I give up, I give up. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's switch back to this idea of a biochemical um, pathway, right? I kind of want you to think about a biochemical pathway like a pipeline. Something goes in at the top and something else comes out in another place, okay? And then these valves control what goes where, all right? So th this is what, what biochemical pathways are doing in your body. Now, let's get back to proteins, right? In, in a biochemical pathway or in our pipeline, what the proteins are doing is that they're acting like valves, so they're regulating flow. They're saying this molecule needs to go over there or over there. Um, sometimes they help provide energy, okay? So it would be like heating up a part of that pipeline. And sometimes they just serve as a master switch. They stop something for happening, from happening or they make it happen, right? That's what proteins are doing in cells, okay? So biochemical pathways convert one compound into another. Lycopene and beta carotene are both pigments that give tomato color. Lycopene is red and beta carotene is orange. Our bodies use beta carotene to make vitamin A and without vitamin A we go blind. All right, we remember all of that? Yeah, you're great. I wish my students were as smart as you are. Okay, so I gave you that simplified pathway earlier, and I think we're ready to advance to the next stage. This is what the biochemical pathway for lycopene and beta carotene really look like. So this molecule right here is beta carotene, and that one right there is lycopene. So lycopene has 18 carbon molecules in a long straight chain. And there's, a, there's an, a protein that we call lycopene beta cyclase that takes the ends of that long straight molecule and curls it up and makes it look like a dumbbell. Okay? So you see how that looks like a dumbbell, right? So the, what I've got in red on this slide are proteins that we know something about. Okay? So we know up at the very top that there's a, a protein called phytoene synthase that makes that yellow pigment. We know that there's a protein that we call tangerine that straightens out the lycopene molecule. And then we know that there's this 
lycopene beta cyclase that makes the dumbbell. And that's the one that we're going to talk about. Okay? And so the juice samples that you see here are juice that's made from tomatoes that have different sets of these genes. They have different variants of these genes. Okay? So getting back to this thing about DNA, what I want you to remember is that if we make a change in the DNA, we can end up changing the protein. All right? So how many of you know where we can find DNA? It's a lot of hands up. I'm going to let you shout it out. OK, good. I heard cells, and that's a good place to start. Um, how about where do we find, how do we find genes in DNA? Does anybody have any idea how we could find a gene? Go. In, it's like DNA. That's where the DNA is, but how do we find a gene in a DNA? That's where we're going now. So you guys got the first question pretty well, but nobody really got the second one. So let's, let's see what we can do with that. So the answer to the first question is that DNA is in the nucleus of every cell. So in this slide, I'm starting with a picture of a flower. right? I then magnified that. That's the next picture. That's still a flower, but you're looking at it really close. The next one is still a flower, closer still. And now you can, see, you can begin to see cells. I then took a piece of that here. And you see how, can you see the cells in there? You know what I'm calling a cell? It, it looks like a bunch of little circles all pieced together. Each of those circles is a cell. All right. The next one over, which is, which is kind of bright green and, and red, that's also the cell. And the bright green is the cell wall. So all plants have cell walls. And the green is the chloroplast. Right? I can use another microscope to take that same picture, and that's what's shown here. Okay? And, and you can see what's red up there are these, these little black and white things down here. Okay? And then another picture here. Can you see the cells on this lower corner? Yeah. Right? You see this piece right here? That's a nucleus. Okay? The nucleus is where the DNA is. It's where the chromosomes are. So it's in the cell in the nucleus. And if we take this cell and we stain it with, with something called DAPI, we can see the chromosomes here. So those are chromosomes. right? So I just blew that one up. And I put this picture of some friends of mine, Taya and Esther, because they're the ones that took all those really pretty pictures that I just showed you. It wasn't me. So you need to know that there's more than one kind of person that does science. Okay? So that's what, a, that's what a chromosome looks like. right? And that chromosome has DNA on it. All right? So we're back to talking about DNA. Again, it's that double helix molecule, right? There's a whole other way that we can think about DNA. And I'm showing it to you in this slide. So this slide presents the DNA sequence of, the, of a protein called phytoene synthase. Okay? And it's depicted in a format that we call FASTA or FASTA. This is how a computer scientist would think about DNA. Right? So it's got all of those letters that we talked about. It's got the A's, G's, T's, and C's, and nothing else. Okay? And the, the format of this is that we use that little caret symbol, and then we put a name. And then everything after that line will contain the sequence. All right? Now, I'm just going to remind you of something. Remember, if you know one side of the sequence, you know the other side. Because C always pairs with G, and T always pairs with A. Right? So. This sequence is something that we would call a string. That's a set of consecutive characters containing information. Okay? That FASTA sequence, that string, contains information in two directions. Right? Because if you know the top strand, which is TA, TT, C, T, C, T, A, you know the bottom strand, the one that we're not showing. So even though we're only showing one strand of DNA, it's really easy to figure out what the other one is. OK? So we can show one strand. It contains information in two directions. And then the other thing is we go back to this idea of a codon, of three consecutive bases coding for information for the protein, right? So if we've got information in two different directions, 
and it takes three bases to give us that information, it means we have six potential frames of information. Does that make sense to you? It's a, it's a little difficult. I'm showing it here for three, right? So we can have that TAT coding for our first amino acid, which means then that the TT, TCT codes for the next one and the CTA codes for the next one. Or we could shift it all one, right? And so the first amino acid becomes ATT. Or we could shift it one more, and the first amino acid is TTC, right? And then if we shifted it again, we're right back into that first frame, OK? So then if you take the second strand where we're not showing the information, you can go through the first process, OK? So the, a piece of DNA contains a lot of information, OK? Because it can contain information basically in six different frames. All right? So we've talked about how we can present DNA as a string. That is, it's the series of the four bases, right? So if we think about tomato as an organism, it would have 420,000 pages of information in its DNA, right? So I think to put that in perspective, how many of you have read the Harry Potter books? OK. How many of you know how many pages were in the last Harry Potter book? It was 759. I checked this morning before I came. OK. So the tomato genome contains literally thousands of Harry Potter books worth of information. All right. There's a lot of information there. So that gets to this next question about How can we find the genes, right? So, OK, DNA can tell us why tomato is red, but in order to do that, we have to find the genes, OK? So for the rest of the talk, we're going to focus on this one gene, lycopene beta cyclase, right? And, and I want to just give you one other piece of information, is that there are some bacteria that will also make beta carotene, OK? So the bacteria are orange, right? And we know about a gene in bacteria that will do that, and we call it CRTL, right? OK, so just keep that in mind. So what we need to do if we're going to, if we're going to go back to this original question is, how can the DNA tell us what color tomato is? We need to be able to find the genes in the DNA, OK? So how do we find what basically amounts to one sentence in almost a half a million pages? How can we do that? So let's think about problem solving strategies. Do you guys ever talk about problem solving strategies? Right? So when you have a big problem, one strategy is to make it smaller. Break it into pieces and solve each piece separately. Right? Another strategy is to find a simpler system, study the problem in that system, and then see if it works the same in the more complicated system. And just to give you an example of that, if we look at a typical bacteria, the amount of DNA is about 4.6 megabytes, megabases. I'm sorry. You can think of it as megabytes, but megabases. The smallest plant genome is 157 megabases. Tomato is 950. And then the largest plant genome that we know of is 150 gigabases, right? So it's 150 times what tomato is. So there's this huge range of the amount of DNA in organisms. Right? And some bacteria have really small amounts of DNA compared to plants. Right? And so the number of pages of DNA in a bacteria is more like 1,500. OK, so it's like two Harry Potter books worth of DNA. Right? OK, and then the third strategy that we can use is we can compare. So we can take a tomato that's yellow and compare it to a tomato that's red. We can take a tomato that's orange, and we can compare it to one that's red, or one that's really red to one that's only a little red. Okay? So we, we've got three different strategies, and a combination of those strategies is likely to get us where we want to go. Okay? So first thing that I'm going to tell you about is that 
We've known that this gene for lycopene beta cyclase was on chromosome 6 of tomato for a long time. Okay? So chromosome 6 has about 30,000 pages, right? but we were able to narrow it down and know that it's on what we call the long arm. So the black part of the slide up above, you can see kind of a red half and a green half. That green half is what we call the long arm of the chromosome. So this is actually looking at a chromosome under a microscope and it's spread out on a slide. Okay? So that long arm has 20,000 pages and that amounts to about 26 to 27 Harry Potter books worth of information. All right? So that's something that you guys could read within a couple of years, right? And, and if you're anything like my kids, if I were to go into one of those books and change a sentence, you might know it, right? How many of you have read one of the Harry Potter books more than once? Okay. So if I, if I changed Ron's name, would you know it? Okay. So, so we're getting this problem down to a scale where it's solvable, right? So the next approach then is to say, okay, in these 26 to 27 books worth of information, can we find a gene that looks like a bacterial gene that we already know something about, right? And it turns out, well, there is a sentence in there that it looks like it might be interesting to us, okay? It looks a little bit like that bacterial gene. So the next step is to switch strategies and start comparing, okay? So what I'm showing you in this slide is a comparison of three different tomatoes. One of them is what you would call a normal tomato, and the next two are really, really red tomatoes. Okay? And so what I've done here is I've lined up all the A's, T's, G's, and C's. And if you look at the stars on the bottom, when you see a star stop, it means there's a difference. Okay? And I also want to point out to you that this, this is what we call an alignment. We've aligned DNA. You can do this on the web at home. Okay, so I, I gave you a URL there for the European Molecular Biology Lab. They have a tool there where you can paste in sequences of DNA to create this alignment. All right, so if you wanted to start playing with DNA, you could go home and you could do it on your computer. All right, so the point I want to make is in this gene, we're seeing some differences between the red tomato and the really red tomatoes. So the next question we want to ask is, do these differences actually affect the protein? Okay. So to do that, we use another tool that you can go to on the web. And it's a tool that allows us to find what we call open reading frames. That's just a fancy name for a continuous sequence of DNA that would code for a protein. Okay. There's no stops in there. And so I ran the DNA sequence for this, what we would call candidate gene, through this open reading frame tool. And look at that. I'm finding one that's, that's almost 1,500 bases of continuous open reading frame. Looks like there's a protein coded there. I've highlighted it in kind of the pink purple there, right? Now, what happens if I do, what happens if I do the same thing for another kind of tomato, right? So the kind of red tomato is on top, and the really red tomato is on the bottom. You see how when I highlight that open reading frame, it's not a full length protein anymore, is it? So those changes we saw in the sequence are going to affect the protein. And it, it turns out what happens is that there's some little, there's, a, there's some missing bases in the really red tomato that disrupt the lycopene beta cyclase gene. And so what happens in that really red tomato is the lycopene never gets converted to beta carotene. Right? So there's more lycopene which is red. Okay? So this gene is one of the reasons that tomato is red. Okay? So I'm going to give you a little quiz really quickly. If beta carotene is important as a vitamin, do we want to eat that really red tomato? <laughs> some people say yes because some people think lycopene is important. But the point is that the high lycopene tomatoes don't have as much beta carotene, which is the one vitamin we really know about in that pathway. Okay? So, 
So we've kind of addressed this question about why tomatoes can be red. Okay, but you guys already know that there's a lot of other colors for tomatoes. So how can we get an orange tomato? Okay, so somebody's saying change part of the sequence, and you're right. You want to say something? Well, okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you. Yes. <laughs> Back there. What's that? Yeah, okay, that, would, that could work. So let me, let's, let's get back to it now. So we, we, we already know that if we, if we mess up the, the protein that converts lycopene into beta carotene, that it would become more red, right? So maybe the opposite is true. If we make that enzyme work better, if we make the protein better, or we make more of it, maybe we'll convert more of that lycopene into beta carotene, right? And that gets back to this, remember the thing I told you about the promoter? Does everybody remember the promoter? Okay, that's the switch that turns the protein on or off, right? Well, so if we take that same gene, the lycopene beta cyclase gene, and we look a little bit to the five prime of what codes for the protein, and we start to compare there, we find a lot of differences. And so you can see the alignment, you can see where the stars are broken, okay? And the one that I've got in the red box up there, every tomato that's red has a C, and every tomato that's orange has a T, okay? So what we think we found here is a change in the switch, right? It turns out that this switch turns the gene on sooner and to a higher level so that it makes more of that enzyme, okay? And so the conclusion is that the high beta carotene tomatoes have a different switch. The gene is turned on higher and longer in the fruit. So instead of getting a lot of that red pigment, most of that red pigment is getting converted to beta carotene. All right? So we've talked about how you can look at the DNA and you can tell if that gene is going to make the tomato redder or more orange. So can you think of how we might use that kind of information to make new tomato varieties that have more vitamins in them? You can answer that. Um, yeah. yeah, that's good. So she's saying that if we, if we change the color, we could get more vitamins, right? So the orange ones will have more provitamin A. The red ones will have more lycopene, right? Did you want to say something? Okay, that's a good that's a good answer. So if we know what the DNA sequence is, we know what the plant is going to look like, and that's actually the strategy that we use. We can we can grow out thousands of tomatoes and we can look at the sequence and we can tell which ones are going to be high in beta carotene or high in lycopene and then keep the ones we want and throw everything else out. Okay? And so one of the things that I wanted to point out is that we're starting to see products on the market that make use of some of these variations in the tomato fruit color. Right? So these are naturally occurring variations that are being used to change the nutritional qualities of tomato products. And so the, the orange harvest that you see there is very high in cis lycopene. The tomato juice with soy is high in lycopene and then it has some soy chemicals. Um, this is one that is thought to be good for people that might be suffering from certain kinds of cancer, whereas the other one is, is just good because it gets more of that compound into your body. Okay. so. If any of this is interesting to you and you want to learn more about it, we've got some videos up on YouTube. Um, so this particular one will tell you how you can extract DNA from tomato. And so if you go to YouTube and you just type in tomato lab into the search window, you'll be able to get to this video. All right? And then 
again, back to our question. You guys think you can answer this question now? I'm not going to make you do it. I just want to know if you think you can answer it. I'm pretty sure your parents are going to ask you tonight. <laughs> All right. So this is, a, this is a final slide that I want to leave you with. Um, I thought it'd be good for you to see the kind of people that do science, right? So um, the, the lower photo is, the, is my group the way it is now. These are the people that I work with. Um, and then the upper photo are, are people that used to work with me that have moved on to other jobs, OK? So all right, so I think we're at the point now where we can take some questions. And Paul's got a microphone, so. Approximately how many stops are there in the micro, in the biochemical path? OK, so ask, ask that How many question. dots? How many dots? Well, OK, so he wants to know how many proteins are in the biochemical pathway. Um, so can I pick one biochemical pathway, or do you want to know about all biochemical pathways? OK, so in the, in the pathway that makes the pigments in tomato fruit, right? if we start at phytoene and go down to beta carotene, there's only about five proteins in that. But there's another 20 that end up making the phytoene. right? So that particular pathway, depending on where you want to start, has 5 to 25. right? Our estimate of the number of genes in tomato, something like 34,000. OK? Go ahead. Paul? Oh, we, we've got a question over here. Why would you want to do the job that you do now? Why would I want to do the job that I do now? That's a really good question. Um, my daughters ask me that all the time. <laughs> so OK, what I like about the job that I do now is that there's something very practical that comes out of the work that I do, and that is new varieties. Um, so how many of you know that Ohio is second in the United States for tomato production, for the kind of tomatoes that go into cans? A few of you know that, right? Um, so we have a lot of tomato growers in Wood and Ottawa County. And for the most part, the varieties that they grow came out of research that we've done at universities here in Ohio. And so I feel like one of the things I can do is can help farmers. Okay? The other thing, though, is that biology is just really cool. So you saw like the pictures from the flower all the way to the DNA. Those are pretty, aren't they? Right? It's kind of neat to be able to peer inside a cell and see something. Right? Then we can talk about the DNA. Right? It's, it's, it's a challenge to figure out how to narrow that big problem down into a small problem. But challenges kind of keep us going. Right? So. What was the URL of that uh, DNA comparison thing? I didn't get enough time to write that down. OK, so he, he asked the URL. Um, I'll go back to that. This is, a good one. this is a good place to start, right? So if you just go to www.ncbi.nlm.nih.gov, OK, that's a good place to start. And this is for the Open Reading Frame Finder, which is GORF. We'll show you that one this afternoon. And actually, if you just Google ORF Finder, I think you get to the same spot. Yeah, okay. so one, one of the things that I'll just mention is you guys have got a lot of activities this afternoon. One of the activities, we have three different sequences of this lycopene beta cyclase gene. And you can play with it on a computer, OK? Do our um, oranges high in carotene because like most because it seemed like most of the um, orange fruits and vegetables you said had carotene. I don't think oranges have. I think they, oranges have a different pigment. Yeah, that's you know I should know that, and I'm going to admit that I actually don't know the answer to that. So I'll Google it later. All right. So. You said that if you don't have any vitamin A, you'll go blind. Is there any other vitamins that, like, if you don't have it, you'll cause you to go like deaf or mute? Um, I I don't know. I don't know. So we're gonna let some people back there answer questions because you guys up in front have been hogging all the questions. It's okay. 
How do changes in DNA change proteins? Okay, it, ch it changes in DNA change proteins because you change the code, right? So it's the same as changing cat to bat, right? So if ATG is methionine, but I change that T to a C, I've now got another amino acid. Okay, and so the, the protein, if you think of the protein as a word, it's now a different word. Okay? How many one celled organisms are there in a tomato? Wow. Um, my honest answer to that is I don't know. So the question was how many one celled organisms are there in a tomato? So you mean like how many bacteria and other things, right? Um, on the surface of a tomato, there can be a lot. I mean, how many of you are aware that there's probably more bacterial DNA on your skin than there is your DNA on your skin? Are you aware of that? Right? I mean, there's one cell organisms are all over the place. The thing about a tomato fruit is if it hasn't cracked, then there's no way for the bacteria or anything to get in. So, yeah. Um, how do promoters know how? Um, like when to open and close. That was, how do flowers know when to open and when to no. close? No, promoter, the promoter. The promoter. You know, that's, that's the kind of question that we don't have full answers to right now. But promoters are, turn, promoters are a piece of DNA that a protein recognizes. So proteins are turning on genes as well, right? And so there's, there's usually a set of sequences that a protein will recognize. And what it does is it unwinds that DNA and it lets something called an RNA polymerase come in. Right? But the, so I've given you a very general answer to that question. But there are, there are lots of people that are trying to answer that more specifically and haven't, haven't come up with very satisfying answers yet. Do uh, yellow tomatoes have more beta carotene than orange tomatoes? No. So the question was, do yellow tomatoes have more beta carotene than orange tomatoes? No. The answer is no. What yellow tomatoes have is a, a lot more of this um, phytoene. It's a precursor, right? So yellow tomatoes may actually not be very good for you, even though they look kind of nice, right? But they don't, have, they don't have the main nutrient, beta carotene, OK? Um, you, you said that. Um each gene has a different color. What, what genes make the purple tomatoes? Oh, OK, that's a good question. That's one of my favorite questions. So this is a, that's, a, that's an artist's question. So if lycopene is red, how could you make red look purple? What happens if you take red and green and mix them together? Well, you do get brown, but you also get purple-blue, depending on how much. So the thing is that, that the purple tomatoes have a different mutation. There's a gene that we call green flesh. But it's, it's, a, gene that, that con it, it's a gene that's involved in, in degrading something called a chloroplast. So the chloroplast is this little green organelle that harvests light for plants. It's why leaves are green. Right? In, in green flesh, so you, have you ever seen a tomato that's not ripe yet? What color is it? Green. Green, OK. So when the tomato becomes red, it's because the lycopene pigment goes way up, and the green pigment, the chlorophyll, goes way down. In this green flesh mutant, that green never goes away. Right? And so you get green on top of red. And depending on the light and everything else, it either looks brown or it looks purple. OK? Are you satisfied with that answer? Yeah. OK. So the, um, the, orange, the orange colored tomatoes are the healthiest for you? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are really challenging me. So we don't, we don't really know as much about human nutrition as we should, right? So. The, you can get an orange tomato because you have a lot of that cis lycopene. And we know that your body will absorb cis lycopene much more efficiently than it does the red lycopene. Okay, so that, that may be better for you 
or it may not, right? The beta carotene we know is good for you for your eyes, right? So my, I, I think the way that I would answer that is a regular red tomato is pretty darn good for you, right? How do tomatoes get their genes? From their mom and dad. <laughs> Um, and the pollen. How do tomatoes get the DNA? Yeah. I mean, so I, I, I gave that answer before from their mom and dad. But basically, DNA is what allows any organism to reproduce, right? And so the pollen, which we consider the pollen to be the male part of the tomato, it has a nucleus and it has DNA. The ovary, which we consider to be the female part, has cells with nuclei and DNA. When those get together, the pollen fertilizes the ovary, and it continues, right? So DNA is basically, it's the, it's the basis of life. Go. What's an ovary? It's a, it's a female reproductive cell, OK? Since you said that, like, the tom orange tomatoes, if you don't get enough of that C, that vitamin A, that yeah. you go blind, could you reverse blindness by eating orange tomatoes? OK. So everybody heard that question, right? So some forms, some forms of blindness can be reversed. So if the blindness is caused by a deficiency in vitamin A, if it doesn't go too long, it can be reversed. Okay? So there, it, it's what you would call dietary intervention. Okay? And that's, you know, I think I should make something clear. I don't think any of you sitting here are at risk of going blind because you don't get enough beta carotene. Um, blindness due to vitamin A deficiency is something that you see in very poor developing countries. Okay? You said there was vitamin A in the in a tomato. Are there how many other vitamins are, are there in it? If if I was going to use a strict definition of vitamins, which is something that you need to get for a fundamental process, the two main ones in tomato are vitamin C and vitamin A. Okay? But there's lots of other things that are nutrients in there as well. But those are the main vitamins. Okay. Uh, you said tomatoes are good, so do you like tomatoes and do you eat a lot of them? Sorry, I'm very curious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like tomatoes and I eat a lot of them. Um, so one of, one of the things that Paul didn't tell you is my wife and I have a small farm and we grow a lot of tomatoes. So that basket on the first slide, those are my wife's tomatoes. And I'm the taste tester. Why do some people call a tomato a vegetable, and why do some people call it a fruit? You, ha you all have very good questions. So tomato, tomato is, from, botanically, tomato is a fruit. OK, so it has seeds in it. It's the reproductive part of the plant. Botanically, that's defined as a fruit. But this is one of those things where the government got involved. So a long time ago, there was a law that was passed that was intended to prevent vegetables from coming from southern countries. Well, actually, it was designed to prevent fruit from coming from southern countries up to the United States. And so a court case went to the Supreme Court to decide, is a tomato a fruit or a vegetable? And the Supreme Court, in all of their wisdom, decided that, well, we use it more like a vegetable, so that's what we're going to call it. OK? But if you ask me, I'm going to tell you it's a fruit. OK? Was that, did that satisfy you, that answer? <laughs> OK. If you know, like, what, um, like, um, what genes can make what colors? Could you make blue tomatoes? OK. So the answer to that question is if we know what genes um, 
If you know what genes make the colors, could you make blue tomatoes? Um, blue, is a, blue is a really tough color. Okay, so if we're just using the natural variation that occurs in tomatoes, we can get pretty purple. But getting it to be blue like the shirts behind you is really tough. Okay? And I, um, honestly, there's not pe very many people that work on tomatoes that are trying to make them blue. I'll, I'll guarantee you that. Um, there are people that work on flowers that are trying to make flowers truly blue. And it's difficult. I have a question for you, David. Okay. So you taste a lot of tomatoes, and next month there will be lots of tomatoes in the stores. Of all the tomatoes in the stores that people can buy, what's your favorite? Yeah. OK, that's a good question. Do I have to have just one favorite, or am I allowed to have more than one favorite? Can I have three? OK, so there, you know what, we, we could have had the same talk today about the size of tomatoes, right? So what, what determines the size of tomato? Tell me. Genes determine the size of tomatoes, right? So there's cherry tomatoes. And then there's like big tomatoes, right? So if I were to say, what's my favorite cherry tomato? There's one that's called Sun Gold, which is really, really good. It's sweet. Um, there's another one that's called Green Doctor, which you probably won't find. Um, I've got some seed, but not very many other people do. Green Doctor is a green tomato, but it, it's got this fabulous taste to it. Um, and then if I was going to go to one of those bigger tomatoes, um, it's one of the purple ones. It's one that's called Cherokee Purple. I think it has great flavor. OK? Um, when you were showing the sh um, slideshow of how the, like when you zoomed in on the flower, you said that, they, that the plant had um, cell walls. Do humans have cell walls also? Good question. So the answer to that is no. So let me just go. This is. This is the slide you were talking about, right? So one of the differences, Sorry. and this is what you know, we usually ask college students this question on exams. Tell and us they get it wrong. Yeah, they do. <laughs> tell us, you know, tell us three differences between a plant and an animal cell, right? Well, one of the main differences is plant cells have cell walls. And in, in the corner of this slide, the green stain is a cell wall. And it's it's made of something called carbohydrates. Have you ever heard of carbohydrates? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, carbohydrates are just very complex sugar molecules that are all twisted together, and then there's a little bit of glue slapped into them, right? Um, OK. Wh who's got the microphone? You do. <laughs> How do you tell fruits, fruit from vegetables? OK. So fruit are reproductive parts of plants. So fruit have seed. OK. Vegetables don't. So celery is a vegetable. Right? It's just the stalk of the plant. Right? OK. Does that answer your question? Lettuce, you're eating the leaf. Right? OK. Um, is a cucumber a fruit or a vegetable? Do cucumbers have seeds? Yes, but my parents keep saying they're vegetables. My mom says they're vegetables. My dad says they're fruit. I don't know which one to trust. Are either of your parents lawyers? <laughs> No. OK. It's just because if they were, then you'd have that issue with the Supreme Court. It's got seed. It's a fruit. Right? Botanically, it's a fruit. Now, you may use it like a vegetable, but it is a fruit. We just have time for a few more questions. You said that um, orange gives you vitamin A. Is there any other colors that give you like vitamins too? Well, orange gives you lots of vitamin A, right? So red red tomatoes have vitamin A. They just don't have as much. Okay. Um, the the purple ones will have vitamin A. The yellow ones have very little vitamin A. Are tomatoes vascular or non-vascular plants? 
they, they are vascular plants. Um, trying to think. You can actually see some of the vascular system on that corner, but it's too far away and too small for me to point out. Somebody said, what's a vascular plant? So we're going to actually have some uh, microscopes again and some slides so you'll be able to see the inside of stems. And we'll tell you what vascular, we'll tell you what the vascular cells will look like. We have another question over here. Yeah. What is that thing on the left side in the middle? Okay. Bug. Which one are we talking about? The left side in the middle. This one right here? Yes. Okay, that, that's a picture of this flower. At a, it's before the flower actually opens up, so it's a very, very young stage, and it's very close up. So this thing right here becomes the petal. Okay? So that's, this is called an electron micrograph. So it, it's taken with a, what's called a scanning electron microscope. What does a vascular plant, like what, what does vascular mean when talking about in a plant? Yeah, she had the same question. So um, vascular plants have a, 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 a um, tissue type, a specialized tissue that will transport water from the roots up and nutrients from the leaves down. Okay, so you, we have vascular systems. It's our heart and our veins and our arteries, right? So in plants, it's not quite the same. They don't have arteries and veins, but they have specialized tissue that transport water and nutrients, okay? And so you would contrast that with certain plants, like some of the algae, which are considered plants, don't have any vascular tissues, okay? What, um, without genes, what, would to, what color would tomatoes be? There wouldn't be tomatoes without genes, right? It's kind of the mix of genes that gives us tomatoes. I think it's... it's Do they have cousins, sort of? Sure, potatoes are cousins. <laughs> what happens if you eat an unripe green tomato? N nothing. They're better if you fry them, though. Um, you, you like the tiny kind that are green, but how do you know if it's the uh, green dactyl or an, an unripe tiny to tomato? Um, if it's not ripe, it's going to be hard, right? So that's one of the things that happens with tomato fruit. When they get ripe, they get soft. 